figure this out first. Does, any, does anything move? Or are they all stationary? They're all stationary, unfortunately. Is it true? This, this one? No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. How about this? <laughs> I feel like a professor. <laughs> okay. First of all, I, you know who I am, that was evident. Thank you. <laughs> My name. Um, I'm a little mixed up this weekend at times because I'm going back between Laura Roslin and Sharon Rader and Major Crimes and Battlestar. But what I wanted to say right out of the gate is that this moment here with all of you, this is really great because we um, premiere Major Crimes a week from tomorrow, season four. There's so many different ways to promote a show, truly. But what I found out about the fans of Major Crimes this year has been profoundly important to me in terms of the future of my work and how we relate to this exchange. Your enthusiasm, your ability to keep coming back to our show, to keep coming back to the closing Major Crimes franchise, to continue to support James Duff and his creative genius and all of us and keep people on that set employed for almost 11 years together is outstanding and I just want to applaud you. Mm -hmm. It's very moving. And so when I was coming here, you know, um, I had a conversation with the infamous creator of Unicorn Hair, Stacy K. Black. <laughs> don't know Stacy, she has been our phenomenal hairdresser, creator of amazing hairstyles since the beginning of The Closer. She also is one of the few, the only, I think, woman in Hollywood to transit from hairdresser to director. And she's directed many episodes of The Closer and Major Crimes, and she is just a phenomenal presence. Uh, so I was talking to Stacy, and she said, well, maybe I'll come. I said, great, we can do the pound together. And then at work on Friday, Philip Keen, who plays Buzz, said, I think I'm coming. So I have them with me. And I just want to ask them a few questions and then we'll take your questions because that's always the most phenomenal part of these events. So, courage is kind of the theme of our season four. And as we all know, courage doesn't exist. It's not necessary if you're not frightened. So courage implies that you're taking a step in a direction towards something that you are afraid to do, and you need courage to do it. So one of the things I wanted to ask Philip to start out with is if he could say something about the courage that's being asked of Buzz at the beginning here of season four. And don't worry, we won't spoil anything. <laughs> <Darn. laughs> well, we might. I have to be a little careful here because we're in the middle of this uh, this new season, and there's been a lot of changes with my character, so I can't give away too much. But um, Buzz has aspirations beyond just being the video techie guy within the squad. And over the years, his responsibilities have, have grown over the years, and I, I think Buzz has also grown in the hearts and minds of all the fans, which has been fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Woo! Oh my God, so 
thank you. <laughs> it's changed so much so that I had friends during the first few seasons of The Closer that used to play a drinking game. And uh, every time Buzz had a line, they'd take a shot. <laughs> So by season four, they really couldn't do that much anymore. So I'm very thankful for that. But um, Buzz has revealed some sort of horrible things that happened to him in the past about his father and uncle being killed uh, on the way home, and his dreams of becoming a police officer were kind of crushed at that time because his mother was worried about his well-being and his safety. Well, Buzz has found a way around that. He's been participating in what is known as the uh, LAPD reserves. So I liken it a little bit to the National Guard, where it's maybe one weekend a month, you know, two weeks a year kind of thing. But uh, whenever they need more more men on the on the, uh, on the force, right? yeah, he, he gets out there and does his duty, and uh, we're going to see that this year. So um, can I add that um, this may be a spoiler, but I just don't care. Philip looks so great in a uniform. <laughs> Now, Stacy is at a really interesting moment in her career because, unfortunately, we've, um, we've lost Stacy as our hair genius. But she never wait, but wait a minute. Because Stacy has mustered the courage to step out into the world and become a full time director. Courage to, to go to Mary and say, I'm going to be leaving the show as your Oh boy, sir. you know that took courage. <laughs> it was, and the courage to leave a place that has embraced me for, well, I've been with actually with Greg Robin and James for 12 years, since Nip Tuck and since the DA, when I first met Philip, to take the, the, the step away from that comfort and that love because love and acceptance are really addictive and I, I, oh, I love them. And, um, to walk away from them when it's no reason to walk away. It's not a bad place. Nobody's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been easy. <laughs> no, no. That would have been easy, yeah. Um, but I'm going to try it because uh, they gave me the opportunity on the closer to be a director, and I don't want to squander that. So I'm going to give it my all. Yeah. 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 I'll just say a little bit about courage too, then we'll take your, your answers. In, in for Sharon Rader, uh, what I'm noticing is I'm playing her, and we are about to, uh, what are we on? Episode six? Episode six, yes. Okay, we're, we're in episode six. Uh, 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, we'll go. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm just gonna keep this makeup on. It's, it's, it's a good thing you live so close. Idea. It's a really good idea, I should just, Keep this makeup on, go to the W Hotel, it's in hours. Oh, well, forget about that. Don't tell Andy. He'll hold you to it. Yeah. So, Sharon Mater, as you know, um, has been brought into a situation and has grown through it and has developed an amazing relationship with a foster child. And um, as it would seem to all of us there seems to be something else that's beginning to tug at her heart. <laughs> so, I don't want to say too much, but there's a lot to be said about the courage it takes to be at a certain point in your life, having been through, in this case, an extraordinarily difficult marriage with Jack, as you're all familiar, <laughs> and, and then start to develop any kind of feelings for someone else, and it takes courage, and that's all I can say. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to take your questions, which we're very excited about. Okay, so. How are we doing this? Should I just do it? I'd love to. Go ahead, you're right there. Right there, honey. <laughs> um, I just want to say I love uh, the closer and I love your cards now. But my question is actually about sneakers. Yes. <laughs> my all time favorite movies. Yes. So I was just wondering if you had you know, any fun stories or anything you wanted to share about working with such an amazing cast. 
I do have one quick story. Um, I never recovered, so it was, <laughs> it was the very first day. Uh, we were doing a table read. As you know what that means, we all sit around the table and read the script for the first rehearsal. And um, the, the studio's all there, the network's, everyone's there. No, the network, it's, it wasn't TV. And my very first line is to look dead on at Robert Redford and say, we're not getting back together. <laughs> and I was all prepared. I mean, I had this script down, you know what I mean? I was just going to rock this thing, I was going to crush it. And I looked right at him and I went, to <laughs> He didn't take his eyes off him. He didn't know exactly what he was doing. So he just like those blue eyes were just kind of going into me and I went, we're not. <laughs> and I turned absolutely scarlet and I don't blush. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a Taurus. You know what I mean? It took me three times. And in the middle of it, he looked at me and he goes, so Mary, what's going on? <laughs> I still haven't recovered. It was incredible. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and sit down and see if I can make that one work. And when you, uh, whoops, hold on. How's this? Good. And when you ask your questions, just make sure you give it your, your full voice because we don't have mics in the aisles for this one, okay? I have someone back there that I saw earlier. Yeah, thank yes, you. sir. Thank you. I just want to build on what she said before about sneakers. First and foremost, thank you for being such a great role model in STEM, in the science, technology, and math world. Oh, wow. You're welcome. As the father of two daughters, I can point to and say, see, you can actually do math. Here's a, here's a role model to look to that's on equal par with other people, other male counterparts in that world. So thank wow, you. that's great. And I, I just wanted to say that, so I sure you asked my question. So. You know, I'm going to go back up here because I want to see your face. <laughs> I want to stand up real quick. Um, just last year we screened it at USC Film School, and it was the first time I'd seen that on the big screen since it premiered. And I was shocked at how, what a great role she was. Yeah. I, I, you don't always realize when you're playing it where you are in the culture, but she was one of the first who had the same kind of knowledge, if not more, of what was going on with all of that stuff. And I was really impressed by it. So thank you for that. That's very cool. Right here. Um, my question is for Stacy. So, um, when you're, James has mentioned that scenes get cut for a lot of different reasons, including technical issues. So when you're in post-production and you're trying to work to put your show together, how does that impact it, like when you lose a scene? And then how do you work with the continual, the, making sure the script stays continual even though you lost that scene? When I do, when the director does the director's cut, we don't lose scenes. Okay. We cut the show that we have shot. So then, if it's a little bit over, then the producer, being James, uh, will come in and he will make the cuts after the director's cut. So we get to cut the whole show, which is great. We don't have to lose anything. So it's up to somebody else. Oh, way above my pay scale. <laughs> well, right now, way above your pay scale. You know, when it's too long, he has to figure out. But most of the time, our shows, we don't get a lot cut. I was thinking about the time. Christmas box. That's what he was referring oh, to the box. when the Christmas box couldn't get put in. Yeah. I think there's you. Yeah. What happens? What do we have, 42 minutes? We do. We have 42 minutes to tell an hour of story of television. Yeah. It's not even a therapist's hour. <laughs> <laughs> The writers are really good in that they, they write to the time that we have. So our scripts are only so long, so the amount of things that have to get cut are, are cut down to a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right here. Yes, Hi. you. Hi. Um, first of all, as a former family therapist who worked a lot with foster families, thank you for the relationship between Sharon and Russ. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, 
to really thank his Jane stuff because this has been just an incredibly important story for him. He just got in the, there with his heart. The fact that know. it's been allowed to develop slowly and let him sort of process his trauma at his own time. The writing is beautiful, but the depth that the two of you bring to it is lovely. Thank but you. But that's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, when um, Major Crimes is obviously sort of a continuation of another project. And when, oh, that, yes. when that started, um, your character was coming in and taking over for sort of this iconic, amazing woman yes. at the same time that you as an actress were experiencing the same thing. And I just wondered if you could sort of talk about what that experience was like. At the same time as an actress I was ex experiencing... You were coming in and sort of replacing Kira. Oh, that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, well, that's, that was the, um, one of the things about it that was so wonderful is that the is was the is is that uh, I, Sharon and I, or at the time, I think we didn't call her Sharon, she was Captain Maria, <laughs> uh, Darth Raider. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like the rain cloud. <laughs> okay, so Darth and I <laughs> experienced uh, uh, Brenda Lee and Kira with a deep respect. <coughs> and what we talked about a lot was finding a way to transition this show without trying to replace anyone because Kira and Brenda Lee are irreplaceable. And I had no, neither she, myself, or the character, I've got enough experience under my belt as an actress to know that. The honor is to step into this ensemble and keep it going. And that takes um, a certain kind of mindset. So the actress had to evaluate the situation the same way Captain Rader had to evaluate, how do I step into this group of people that really don't want me here. <laughs> they do not like Darth Vader. <laughs> and how do you begin to connect with people who you are going to have to manage? And how does a good leader carefully begin to um, get the people around her to trust her? So the actress and the character were the same. And because James is great at knowing that and recognizing it, as were all the other actors, of course, those moments just slowly evolved where people found themselves trusting her or having a little thing. Like I remember my first couple of moments <coughs> with Philip where Buzz and Sharon like kind of worked together. You know what I mean? And just let it happen. And that's why it worked, I'm convinced, is what you said. You let it happen slowly. Okay, next question right here. Uh, yes, a few years ago when you first started doing Battlestar, you talked about the challenge of not knowing sort of the arc of the character when you started because you were doing plays and everything where you, you knew what was going to happen from day one and that was really challenging for you as an actress and I was just curious since you just finished the show in, in Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, if, if that sort of if you felt that same kind of challenge uh, with knowing the, knowing the character from the, from the beginning and um, and if coming back to major crime, if you sort of felt that same kind of... Yeah, the question up here is, um, I just recently did the Cherry Orchard in Philadelphia. And I haven't done a play since I was on Broadway 17 years ago. And when I came into this world, the world of television and film, I had done plays for a long time. I've been around a while. <laughs> Don't that look good? <laughs> Was it, did I find it difficult to transition back into this again, television? The best between doing a play and doing television and doing film. All three of them require com completely different entry ways. It's all your talent, it's all your mind, it's all your creativity, it's all acting. But each medium requires a different point of entry. 
And after doing all of it for a long time, the differences become exciting rather than, you know. I did feel a little intimidated the first week of rehearsal at the Cherry Oak Tree because I couldn't understand why there were all these actors everywhere <laughs> doing things while I was talking. <laughs> It was my mind. <laughs> and they're over here inventing bits and doing this stuff and making all this life. And I, I kept getting shy. And suddenly I realized, oh my God, I think it was my daughter who pointed out to me, as many of you know she's with me, Mom, for 20 years, when it's time for you to talk, the whole sound stage goes silent. There's a big buzzer. And everything comes to to a silence, because when we speak, the world goes silent. She goes, so you're just getting used to reality again. <laughs> so once she told me what was happening to me, I was fine. <laughs> Next question. Over here. Right here. Um, my question was actually for you, but I'd like to hear uh, your take on that as well. Um, since you've done theater now again, um, is there a play or a role that you would really, really like to uh, to do? Mm -hmm. And for, uh, for you as well, and Stacey, now with this exciting new path you're on, anyone you would really love to work with, anything you, any projects you have your eye on? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do feel like I have to do uh, The Mom and Glass Menagerie one of these days. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I think I, I gotta do it pretty soon. Um, and also, I'm talking to someone about um, the possibility of long days journey into night. So that that might be up ahead. But other than that, I, I I can't even start thinking about it because we're so creatively engaged here. But yes, there will be others. How about you guys? Um, I've been reading Big Man, and I would love to be able to do that. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I want to do a movie with Harry and Philip. Yeah. <laughs> the reason Parker Richard Brass has so many more words now is, is this lady's fault. She directed me in a short film that she wrote, directed, and produced. And after that, um, Buzz began to speak sentences. <laughs> and his friends got drunk. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It was also after that short film <laughs> started for me, called The Truth is Underrated, that I got my first directed gig on the closer. So we, Look to each other a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's some like, original content that I want to create and shoot um, some movies and some TV shows. I'm trying to make it happen. But other than that, I want to direct anything anybody will hire me for. <laughs> <laughs> Next question over here, this lady with red hair. I'm sorry? Oh, well, let's see. Me hingi na gilwek suya chana chante. I know I've done that a million times when people ask me because I can remember it, and also because it means my husband I am missing him, which is is true a lot because we work and we travel a lot. No, I don't get to practice it, but let me just take this moment since you brought it to mind. I don't know how many of you have already been to our, our table and, and had signed, you know, came and had things signed and stuff, but I thank you from the bottom of my heart because this money is going to Santa Glesley University on the Rosebud Reservation. Many of you know about it, the organization Mary Cares, which is a fan group. They have been raising funds for it and we're, we're becoming more and more involved in this beautiful situation where there's a university <coughs> Out in the middle, I don't know if any of you have ever been to South Dakota or seen Rosebud or Pine Ridge. They're extraordinarily beautiful, but very isolated. And this university is um, is a life force for for particularly young people. And some of the money, the money that we raise, really is <laughs> I'm so excited about this. I can't. <laughs> But don't be on speech, I think you should try it in Lakota. Uh, the money that we raised last year with Mary Cares and through my signings and stuff went to um, them being able to open up a daycare on the campus. And then we were able to 
speaking a speech hire uh, the cook to teacher for the babies, which in my opinion is maybe the single most important thing they can do at that age because re-owning, because that was my whole part in dances, re-owning one's native, this makes me cry, I'm sorry. Uh, re-owning your native language after on some level being occupied for hundreds of years, getting back to the roots of your DNA and understanding how to communicate there while you are developing the ability to be in the world and accomplish what needs to be done as you're speaking English and assimilating is so fundamentally important to being on the planet that, that you know, I don't know if you guys were at the Battlestar panel that Ed and I did, but a lot of the talk was about, you know, Eddie's famous quote at the, at the UN, there is no race but one, the human race. And not allowing our differences to be a place where we connect because we're all the same. And making our differences be a place where we fight because we're not the same is a huge mistake. Empowering these kids has been phenomenally important to all of us, and we're going to continue to raise funds for these people. So thank you for this weekend. Anyway. <laughs> By the way, Philip will be at the table right after we're done. We're going straight down, and he will be signing today, too, and he's donating his, uh, his fundraising to Santa Glasgow as well. So I'm really <laughs> Yes. Can I ask you about survival? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it has to be short because I swore off on it. No. <laughs> so painful. They were so mad at us, I thought. I, I honestly, we literally could not do it. And I said to them, why don't you just shut the scene down, we'll come back to it tomorrow, which made them even more aggravated because they thought it was just a simple matter of not laughing, but we were gone. <laughs> and they never did that one scene. <laughs> and the whole thing, and I tried to shoot her. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, please, can Starbuck and Rosalind have something else? Do you know what I mean? So, we don't know if that's why it happened, but at least it was a good memory. <laughs> yes, right there. Hey. Yes. Um, well, mine is a major question. Good. Um, I, I love writer, and I've loved her since she first appeared on The Closer. I felt like she really re-energized the show because that was a really different dynamic for Brenda to have that kind of Foil and then later ally. Yeah. Right? And so you talked a lot about her not being popular and the journey from antagonist to protagonist. And it's been beautiful and fun to watch and everything. Um, but it seems Raider Raider's like an iceberg, I think. You see that not not cold. You see the tip of the <laughs> I don't know how to take that. I was like, um, iceberg. That's <laughs> <laughs> So much under the surface. How about glacier? I think like kind of really slow. Yeah. Being threatened by climate change. Yes. Yeah. So there's so much under the surface, but I feel yeah. like you know she's so admirable and she seems almost always to do the right thing. Yeah. So in some ways, like she's in danger of becoming a paragon of moral rectitude, which yeah. is kind of boring. Yes. So I want to know yeah. what Raider's flaw is. Oh, she's many. First of all, she um, is a bit of a control freak, which we've seen very clearly. I must go first. <laughs> yes, you know, one of her famous lines. Uh, it wasn't written, by the way. <laughs> she just got crazy. <laughs> and James loved it. Um, she control, rules, structure. She craves all of that. And that's a very good thing. But. It's not the whole deal. Raiders had a lot of trouble in her life. That marriage was tough. So I, I say uh, what I notice is her biggest struggle 
is to, she's a very deep feeling woman, but she tries to stay out of there. And I think that, to a certain extent, is a flaw. You know what I mean? We gotta go into our feeling state and gotta live from there, no matter how it hurts, or no matter how scary it is, you know? So, I would say her need to control is a bit of a flaw. What do you think? <laughs> I think it's a flaw and a strength at the same time. Yeah. I mean, she's a bit of a rounder rule book. I mean, isn't she? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Philip, let me ask you, when when River <coughs> emerged as, as Buzz at in the, in the beginning, how did you perceive her and how did you transit? I think Buzz is always craving rules and structure because his life is so chaotic and growing. <laughs> So he found sort of a hero in Rainer and that uh, maybe things are going to be cleaned up around here in the squad room, you know? Um, people were kind of pushing the boundaries of the law and things like that, and not necessarily breaking them, but I think he appreciates uh, a good hard line being drawn. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And Stacey, when you were first directing her, because um, when I guest starred, a Sharon Rader in the clothes there. Uh, it was Stacy's episode that she directed that I got a, a Emmy nomination for. That was yeah. <laughs> but you saw her right from the get go as well, and then you had to direct her. Do you, do you, how did you, I guess, the director view that kind of switch from? antagonist to protagonist. How does that experience, what is that experience for a director? Well, I got that great script where you were, Raider was trying to help Brenda. And Brenda didn't want her help and didn't think she needed her help, but she really, really did. So we had, we had fun. Oh, right, it was about the bag. <laughs> it was about, they wanted Brenda to be the chief of police. And Raider really wanted her to be the chief of police and Brenda didn't think she wanted it. And your, your whole, the whole episode was you getting her across the street. <laughs> Without that bag. Without the bag, with a different, different dress, different hair, just looking, you know, and playing the part of a woman in power. Yeah. She was giving of Raider to Brenda, and Brenda didn't want it, and then at the end she took it. Yeah. Um, right. you know, I just remember having a lot of fun with it. Yes. Yeah. We had a lot of female power in that yeah. episode, which was fun. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I have a question for Bill. Yep. Uh, do you see your character of Buzz having more interaction as a mentor to uh, Rusty? Absolutely. I mean, from the beginning, Buzz was tasked with being the, the babysitter, if you will. Um, it was sort of an annoyance in the beginning. Why, why do I have to take care of this kid? You know, how long is he going to be here? And he's become the younger brother that Buzz never really wanted. <laughs> But I think age-wise, with the exception of Sykes, he is closest to Rusty's uh, world in, in, in anything. And he, since he's not an officially a cop, he's still a civilian, I think Rusty is a little more <laughs> at ease speaking to him about certain things. So yes, definitely, I think Buzz is a, sort of a mentor to, to Rusty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, back there? Yes, you? Um, this is a question for both of you. Do the writers allow you any input in your character development? Yeah, Philip, you want to take that? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, there were a couple of times where just discussing certain storylines with the writers, I would say something, not always, but sometimes I say things that are funny, and they, <laughs> and they do end up in the script. There was one with uh, the very beginning of The Closer, where Brenda mispronounces or misinterprets what uh, a Spanish-speaking Suspect says, she says, did he just say avocado? Said, no, 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 it's abogado, which means attorney. And that is sort of continued in his character. Right? Yes, exactly. He's still correcting all of us. Yes. Which is really beautiful. Buzz yeah. is a bit of a pronunciation Nazi. <laughs> so, yes. Where are you that asked that question? There you are, darling. Uh, yes, they do. The writers, uh, led by James, um, we, get, we have this amazing read-through of every script, a table read with everyone in the entire company there, and the guest stars there, and the whole writing staff is there to listen. So, if things come up that you feel you're beneath, or that you don't understand, or whatever it is that you have trouble with, they are open, right then and there, the door is open, the doctor is in. 
and you are free, very free to express it. And if they can fix it, they will. And if they think it would be better not fixed and then you've got to kind of step up to the plate and pull it off, they will state that too. So there's a nice challenge that goes back and forth between the two parties. That's been my experience. Next question. Uh, pick it up, someone on this side. You there with the hat? Yes. My question is about the episode poster board. Yes. Um, I was curious, um, I was curious about whether Captain Radar wants people to, is there a mission for them to go to jail or is it just some kind of justice? Because, I mean, you can kind of sympathize with that character because he goes to jail, it's not a good thing, but yet Captain Radar wants him to live. What is kind of her, what do you, what do you think her? I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. Because I think that our whole series, um, through all of us, are uh, different roles at different points. We have to kind of line our characters up with what they may or may not feel about the death penalty. And that's a huge, huge question. And sadly, part of that answer is how much justice can, can a city or state literally afford? Because it costs tens and tens of millions of dollars to keep someone on death row. Um, versus you know, incarcerating them or, or because of the appeals process and things like that. So it's, it's a question, I mean, and with budget cutbacks in all different departments, police forces and city governments and things like that, decisions have to be made that are you know, financial based. Right. And I do think that Sharon Rader would prefer to not have the death penalty. But uh, it's there. It's part of the system in the world, but the deal-making process is something that she knows a lot about. And um, sometimes you have to separate your emotional feelings from the system, the way it works, and the tools you have at hand. So that's always the negotiation. Another question. Uh, back there? No? Yes, here. Um, my question is not really about the specific show. So I know you've dealt with a lot of social issues and civil rights issues and battle struggles and cool crimes. If there was a specific issue that you could deal with in you know either your current role or in a role that you want to play, what would that issue be and what would you want to say about that issue? Oh. How old am I? I think the next I think we're headed into a time period where we're going to have to tell stories about water, mm -hmm. you know, Fury Road. Um, I think that uh, we've got. I don't think we're. I don't think we're uh, finished raising women up. Or women are still being used as weapons of war. We've got children dying right now due to not only poverty but lack of hydration all over the world. So I think for me, um, when I think about the storytelling that I want to be involved in, hopefully in the next couple of decades, it really just, I just wanted to be inside of our, our real struggles. I just don't want to waste any time, honestly, in storytelling that it doesn't mean it all has to be dark. You know what I mean? But there's got to be a way we can talk about what's happening to us. We are in such an amazing time of danger and transition and hope all at once. So my feeling is that the stories we tell and have, and because particularly because television has become a major storytelling force, it is so usurped in the way movie going, and we can binge now, which means we can really do a PhD in whatever we want to do, we, whatever we care about. So I'm hoping you know, to be involved in things that are going to help us understand where we are. That's really what's kind of important to me. Next question, thank you, sir. Hey, just, I'm sorry, I want to take it back to Battlestar for just a moment, but two <laughs> things. One was every character in that show, I've never been <laughs> as emotionally invested in characters as I was with all of you on Battlestar. <laughs> fighting for the human race, you're fighting for women as a president, as a teacher, and battling cancer. It was amazing the way you did it, and quite honestly, inspired. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. 
what is your daughter's name? Uh, May. And how, what's the situation? She, we lost her in the summer of 2009. I'm so sorry, ma'am. And thank you for speaking up. I really appreciate it. Oh, okay. In the memory of May, let's all applaud. You know, playing people on, on television and movies are struggling with um, ailments and diseases and are struggling with mortality is, is, is an honor that I could have never foreseen at the beginning of my career. I had no idea how many loving, beautiful people playing those kind of roles would bring into my life. So, although you are all always thanking all of us for that kind of thing, really and truly, uh, the gift is over here as well because the humility that you are forced to develop, despite your ego, is just extraordinary. So thank you for that. Um, next question, right here. Um, as a, an actor, and this can go to everybody as well, and including Stacy, there's, <coughs> within your body of work, there's always that, and going back into the emotional stuff, sorry. Um, oh, there's that know. part or that specific scene that because you're you're always having to bear your soul and find the truth and the honesty in re every situation as as an actor. What's that one scene that you were part of that just took that emotional toll? And it took you even after it cut or the play was over, it took you some time to like shake it off. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it, you still kind of get that emotional recall back. Bill, uh, there was one scene where. Unfortunately, part of it was cut. It was when there was a witness in the interrogation room who had somehow smuggled a gun in and was waiting behind the door to shoot Brenda as she was going in there. And I'm watching her walk through there. Uh, she passes by my office in the electronics room and I see the suspect pull the gun out. And so I jump through the door, grab her, pull her out of the way. And because we had to keep doing that so, so often, and I was pulled her against this wall that I had to hit this mark and not go through a glass wall. I needed to be sure I got exactly where I needed to be. So that was one of those those, those times. It was really exciting. Stacy, as a director? Yeah. Um, those episode a couple years ago I directed where a mother took the law into her own hands after gangs killed her son. And there was a congressman's son living in the neighborhood trying to make it all better and she kills him. And her reasoning for what she did, you know, they all have a good reason for what they do, but the scene with her in the murder room with the dog. Yeah, that was good. When I read that, I cried. Um, when I read it again, I cried again. When we shot, I cried. When, I, when we were shooting Mary, um, observing this as Raider, feeling everything that this mother felt. Um, she's a mother, she probably did the same thing her kid in some, on some level, and watching her hold that in and not being able to show her emotion to everybody, uh, cried again. <laughs> when it aired, I cried again. So that, was, that, that scene for me was the, the killer, and watching all the actors, all the actors react to her, because they didn't want to throw her in jail. She was, you know, the mother was in pain, but she broke the law, she had to go. But that was the killer for me. You know, I think that it, the question is really great, because doing a, a crime show, particularly this one, because it has a level of both humor and sensitivity that allow you to relax into the humanity. It's not just a procedural, do you know what I mean? And what I have noticed now over the years is that it is those moments where you're sitting across from a guest actor who's come in and has to just open their heart with some confession well, I can't even, like, I get chills thinking about it, where the actor themselves has to come to terms before they act it with, what would it be? What, who am I? Where is it in me that I could have murdered someone and hurt someone that violently and betrayed someone? And where does that leave my soul? And when I watch these actors sometimes, and it comes upon you when you don't even suspect it, and they're trying to open that door for you to see, and I just lose it because, and, and Sharon can't, because she has to investigate them. Do you know what I mean? I could never be her, by the way. <laughs> I'm so moved by 
how much we're all alike and there but for the grace of God go every single one of us that we haven't committed murder, honestly. Mm. You know what I mean? The more I learn about it and the more I see what drives people to this desperate act and how they lose their, their minds and life becomes so dark, you start to develop a, a feeling that you have to work very hard to shake off at home. And you don't realize it's coming over you, right, Book? Stacy, it's like, you think you're fine. You know, I would just sign another day of major crumbs. Whoop, whoop! <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, like starting season four, about a month into it, this, this season, my family, they were going, are, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm not okay. Well, what's up? Sometimes, it's really, really hard to think about crime mm -hmm. and to see how hard people work to not commit crimes and how they fail and to see the beleaguered justice system mm -hmm. and to see the people trying to, the families trying to adjust with loss when their children, you know. So I have a great, I think for me on this one, to a long answer to your very good question, is the um, a developing uh, camaraderie with uh, the police force and what they go through and and trying to carry a little bit of it with them, you know, because you can't shake it off. Yeah. A nice I'm, question. Go ahead, Philip. On that note, I recently spent an evening, just, just one night, with uh, some of the LAPD uh, in one of the most dangerous parts of the city. It's called uh, Shooting Newton. There's so many... Uh, crimes that are committed in that area. And just the courage that it takes to put on that uniform and to go out there and be a visible target. I mean, people, they don't know who's behind that uniform, who's wearing that, that badge and that gun, but they hate them. And knowing that you are going to be, be experiencing that every day you go to work, I think, takes a tremendous amount of courage. And then just watching them, how they were so kind and generous with everybody that they met. Um, not like what we see all, all the time now with these videos yeah. being the, the bad cops that are out there. Right. There were a few of them, of course, I and mean, we're all human, but just to be able to see what is it they go through on a nightly basis this is pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Yes. Um, I have two little white bird questions. Can um, you talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Buzz has kind of been jabbing at uh, Benzo a lot lately. And <laughs> a greater influence there. And then also, could you all tell me who your favorite characters are? Uh, I've got so many favorite characters, uh, but yes, I think Buzz does emulate Raider in a, li in a little bit, especially with his new responsibilities that are coming up. Uh, and he's part of the new guard that's coming up, so he wants to let the older guys know that, hey, there's a new way to do things, and this is how it's going to be done, and it should be done, and he gets a little flack from that. So, and I love working with GW. I think we play off each other really, really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Rusty's a lot of fun. The captain and I don't get that much to do together, but when we do, I, I think it's pretty special. Yeah, um, you know, we don't ever really say who's our favorite character. We work with them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like saying, oh, you're my favorite child. <laughs> you don't do it. But, that's, but, that's but who am I here with today? Just saying. <laughs> to this, but because we're here, I will say, Philip and I, I'm sure we agree on this, is that the, the diversity in that cast is one of James Dove's passions. He's committed to it. Do you know what I mean? Diverse in every way. I think that 
as a collective, we feel that it's important because if you ask the question, why aren't there more minorities in, in, the, in the force, then you have to ask the question, why do minorities feel alien to the system? Mm -hmm. And then you've got a big problem because it's a system that's keeping us down. And we want to be able to, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of diversity in the police force in LA, I'll tell you that. So it's sort of, how do we continue to show that we're all the same again? And so that, but Stacy Phillips, do you want to answer? Absolutely, it was one of the, the main points that I know James and the creators of the show wanted to make was that the show would represent Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is not all white, it's not all Latino, it's not all black. It's a mixture of people. I think there are over 100 different languages spoken in the public schools um, in, in Los Angeles County. And the characters that you see there, Michael Paul Chan, for instance, this is the first time he told me that as an Asian American, he was not asked to put on an Asian accent and be the evil Asian guy or the spy or the, you know, running prostitutes. Um, Sykes is not the urban black woman, you know, that you see so often on, on these shows. We, they're, not that those people don't exist, they do, but everybody is their own person in race and in, in, in personal identities have nothing to do with the specifics of these characters. We just happen to be people working together. Another question. That's, that's been a question that's been brought up quite a bit, and there was a character who appeared for a short time who played opposite Detective Sanchez. And she was a Latina character, and Sanchez was very interested in her until he discovered that she doesn't go that way, you know? So it has been visited, it's just not, um, it's, it's not something that's, that's been a big presence in the show, but it has been noted and, and, and it has been discussed. Another question right here. Where we've only got about two more questions here, so that I have to let you ask a question. <laughs> because she has on a Green Bay Packers hat. <laughs> Going back to the episode where Sharon was helping Brenda get across the street. Yeah. She was part of a committee to get women higher up on the force. Yeah. Is she still part of the committee and maybe mentoring Amy to get move up and well it would be wonderful to see that happen and maybe uh, get Sharon into the commander position <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know there's a whole movement out there <laughs> make, make Sharon a commander. and and actually that issue does emerge a little bit I'm not sure where we're headed this is what I will say uh, in terms of Amy oh my god yeah Amy should go to the top of the force you know there's no doubt about it um, I think that what Sharon is doing right now has a different kind of appeal to her than, than perhaps the aspirations towards higher levels of power that she held prior to this job. There is something about being closer to the detective work itself that feeds and fulfills the work day, and I haven't noticed Sharon, Sharon wondering too much about the commander position. I have to say though that once I saw that on Twitter, <laughs> hey, yeah, <laughs> one more question. Oh God, yes, yes. Um, I love the humor in the show, and I think that you and amazing supporting cast, just do a wonderful job finding the little moments that you, that you can lighten things up and bring that other level into it. I uh, wanted to know if behind the scenes, it's as much fun to work on that show as it appears it would be compared to the other <laughs> piece of dramas that you see. Well, I don't know, should we tell the truth? <laughs> <laughs> 
Any post-it notes on Provenza because he falls asleep during breaks? <laughs> We do laugh a lot. Yes. I mean, the other day, um, Michael Paul Chan and uh, and uh, Kieran. So it was uh, Tao and Sykes and um, Raider and it was Raymond. And we we had to do a scene where the four of us came together and did some very serious cop dialogue. <laughs> Forget about it. It was <laughs> it was <laughs> I love the tongue twisters they give us. Oh um, my some, God! Some of the say, names. Say Does anybody have any trouble pronouncing names? I mean, uh, uh, yeah. Mehar Sethi. Mehar Sethi. Yes, say it fast three times. Mehar Sethi. Mehar Sethi. What was that one? What was that one? Oh God! I wish Karen was here. She always remembers it. I had that one that oh, had she's, 25 she, S's she in it. She had to do a freezer full of frozen ones one night. Yeah. <laughs> I said something about the sensibility of this of this sophomore on the senior year on the spectrum. <laughs> Yes, ridiculous. And you can feel the writers laugh. <laughs> See, there, is, there is a camaraderie, you know what I mean? There really is. And uh, it's all created at the top, you know what I mean? It comes down from the top, and there's a life force there that, that uh, you know, yeah, let me know as well. And there's a lot of humor that's written into the show, even though a lot of the subject matter we talk about is pretty dark. I don't know if there are any doctors or nurses in the house here, or anybody in the medical field. You, or even just being a school teacher, or whatever it might be, there's some pretty horrible things that might happen to you, and you have to laugh. You have to make fun of it. Otherwise, I think you would just lose your mind. Gallows humor. Yes. Right? And, do we have just um, Can we have one more question? Go ahead. How much time do we get? Say it again. Uh, speak to the impact of women in power on society. Well, I just think very quickly, um, my perception of where we are on the planet is that um, feminine, the feminine, which has been held back for a long time in whatever form that takes, is um, finally surfacing as a way to balance destruction and finally surfacing as an entity of power in its own right, in a balancing kind of way. So what, if you just think of it as an energy principle, what's happening is that the energy that the feminine can bring to situations that have been classically masculine can allow the masculine to refocus itself as well. So I feel the more women we have who are working face to face with men, as we try to survive what's happening on the planet together, the better chance we have at survival. So that's kind of how I feel. Thank you all.